I spent a few weeks once at the uh, German equivalent of the National Cancer Institute. And they were in the process of having their biostatistician retire, and they were thinking somewhat about replacements. And when I left, I left a little note on the right man's desk saying that what they needed was not a uh, biostatistician. They needed a philosopher of experiments and surveys. And uh, that's how to define. You can find lots of people who are supposed to be biostatisticians, but to pick out of those the ones who are good at thinking about things over on the subject matter side when necessary <coughs> is, is harder. And I think one collection of things have, have, has been that. Now, that's wholly separate from what I'd call biomedical th things and uh, clinical trials. I've been a regular visitor at Merck's for 40 years. And uh, I come in half a dozen days a year. And typically when I come in, I get a half a dozen problems thrown at me. Uh, and I have no idea what they're going to be when I come in, which it works fine with me. I'm sure there are other people that wouldn't. Uh, and out of that have come a certain number of papers, particularly joint with Joe Seminera and Joe Hayes, and more recently with Heine Gunn. This again is, is being driven by the applications. Uh, there's a paper floating around on tightening the clinical trial that's probably going to appear in controlled clinical trials one of these days. And But that's sort of uh, taking the technology that came out of the thinking for the Advisory Committee on Weather Control, <laughs> where you have the question, what about the cloud seeding experiment? How do you really, how should you conduct them, how should you analyze them, given the special difficulties? Now, I got asked to try to help this commission in this regard, and I thought about it for a little while and decided it would be foolish of me to do it alone, and that what I needed was people that I interacted effectively with and not people who'd been in the business. So uh, it turned out to be Lyle Jones and David Brillinger and I. And uh, it worked fine, and we ended up producing volume two of the report. And we were happy it was volume two because the uh, chairman of the commission wrote a foreword for volume two in which he roughly said that the commission didn't feel it had to take seriously all the things in here. <laughs> Which meant that we didn't have to take seriously all the things that the commission said in volume one. <laughs> but the double randomization stuff came out of that because that seemed to be that seemed to be the sensible way to conduct. Well, the double randomization stuff with orthogonal arrays of maybe degrees five or to five or six seem to be a sensible thing there. Now, I think double randomization is going to have a place in a lot of areas, but maybe w with a, in a different framework each time. The clinical trial, you don't, I don't think you need orthogonal arrays you, because it isn't that there are four or five patients who get all the weight and, and have all the effect and have, you have to worry about them, except you don't know who they are in advance. In the weather modification situation, you have four or five storms. You don't know in advance what they are, and they're going to produce a pretty large share of the rain, or the snow, or the hail, or what have you. So you do need the sort of control that the orthogonal arrays produce. But 
uh, again, the, the, the clinical trial side, it's partly been distilling thought after experience in actual clinical trials, and partly uh, the question of saying, if you really wanted to tighten up the clinical trial, what could you do? And the answer is, that if you go a double randomization route, you can be you can be perfectly sure about your probability statements, and the reasons why you're sure can be inspected and monitored. And nothing, there are no assumptions about how things are distributed in the real world. They will determine perhaps how, how, what the quality of your things are. You may. Uh, they will determine whether the statistics you chose to play with were well chosen or not. But they won't have anything to do with whether 5% is 5%. And given the probably excessive emphasis on keeping 5% 5% that's associated with clinical trials these days, uh, it seems to me that's, that's a place where you need a technique that behaves according. Dave, were you at Princeton when John used to have those problem seminars where people would come in and present their problems? Because that was one of his favorite uh, uh, graduate courses. Well, I knew something like it's that under the heading of the Applied Statistics that's Seminar, what she which means. is a sort of that's what she afternoon means. colloquium. The yeah. understanding is that for admission, the speaker had to have a problem, but not necessarily <laughs> any of the answers. Absolutely, yes. And yeah. uh, just, just opening things up that way uh, was a very liberating experience for, for graduate students in particular who might have thought that, you know, if you're giving a talk, you're supposed to have it all wrapped up tidily and, and be able to tell what the results are. Well, John yeah. enjoyed those a lot. And as far as I can tell, uh, a fair number of graduate students have the reaction, had the reaction that David has, that uh, <coughs> they were quite educational. Yes, I certainly thought so. <coughs> well, one area of technology, John, that, that uh, in technology of statistics that uh, I'd like to hear some of your comments on is your work in the entire area of graphics, not just the st static displays, but yeah. dynamic ones to look at high dimensional data, and you were your path-breaking stuff in, with Prim 9 much earlier than, than what other people were, were willing to even think about in those days of dynamic graphics. To what extent was that sort of related to thinking about large data sets or um, what was the story behind the graphics? Well, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's, there's a story behind the graphics. Uh, I've been interested in graphical techniques for a long time because I think it's fairly well established that there are people who can learn things from numbers and people who can learn things from pictures. Uh, and there may be some overlap, but there's a there's examples of both that don't overlap. Uh, David and I have done a little about pencil point plots, for example, which is a question of saying, when you talk about uncertainties, you should spend the ink on the certainties and not the uncertainties. So that says, Instead of having a short bar in the middle, you need a long something with a hole in it so to, to replace the bar. So, so apertures instead of intervals. I yeah, the apertures instead of bars, because you really don't know where the world is, except that it's somewhere in the hole. And giving a picture with a hole conveys that to me a lot better than trying to do any kind of a bar structure. Now that's, that's one extreme. Uh, that's a very classical problem. At the other, other extreme perhaps is Prim 9. Prim 9 grew. Uh, 
I was interested in what you could do in the dynamic graphics area. And I knew that Bill Miller had got some things put together at Slack. And uh, so I arranged to come and spend some time at Slack on during a sabbatical. Jerry Friedman was supportive. Mary Ann Fisher-Keller was skilled. We spent two or three months where we would try something and one afternoon it would be running and we would sit and look at it for a while and then decide what to try next. And Mary Ann would either have it up the next day or the second day following. Wow. <laughs> you see what I mean about skill. Skill. Without her. So we went through maybe 30, 40 micro generations. And what came out the far side was Prim 9. The obvious challenge was better ways to look at data in more dimensions. In particular, since this was Slack, but this was Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, uh, we were looking at data from particle physics. And uh, we, uh, we got something so it would do pretty well, and then uh, I guess about a year later, I came back and spent a short, a short time while we uh, produced the film. We were very fortunate because one of the other people in the group had always wanted to make movies, had had a course <laughs> in movie making. <laughs> and so between him and Jerry and Marianne and I, we produced the, this Prim 9 movie, which was, uh, I'd say, uh, pretty much opened up the rotating picture game. Eventually, people like David Andrews found out how much you could do with relatively little computing power if you, if you put your mind to it in that direction. Presently, Kay Bassford, who's a statistician in the Department of Agriculture in Brisbane, University of Queensland. And I are trying to understand how to produce a good set of pictures to relate to a big plant breeding experiment. Now this implies sensible analysis before you try to make the pictures and sensible making of the pictures when you mm -hmm. come to them. That is really very close to the exploratory analysis of variance yes. thing. Because this stuff is pretty much genotype by environment with some uh, subclassifications on either side sometimes. It's so it's Two things crossed, and the things that are crossed may be simple and they may be compound. But uh, one isn't interested really here in the, the mean squares and the uh, more better the overlays and so on, and the subtables. The, the focus is a little different, but it's still is essentially a factorial situation. These have tended to come from, as you can see, from concrete problems, like most things as far as I'm concerned. In the wake of a, of a presidential election, let's take another very real applied problem. I think many of the people who may see this tape probably don't know at all, uh, and at the time I didn't know very much about it at all because it was pretty much kept under wraps about your involvement in projecting the election results in the various presidential elections from, I guess, about 1960 to 1980 for, yeah, uh, for yeah. NBC yeah. News. Yeah. Well, it started out for RCA because RCA was, it wanted to advertise their new computers. Uh -huh. And uh, NBC was tied in, and so it, 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 went on, it went on NBC, but eventually it moved over to NBC sponsorship. Yeah, well... That is the best example of real-time statistics I know.
Uh, either, <laughs> either you do it in a timely fashion or you don't. And if you don't, it doesn't do much good. I got involved in this initially, I think, because John Mowkley got involved. He would have been involved with ICA in the planning of this and decided a little more statistical input would help. And so I got involved in the 1960 operation where one of our colleagues mm -hmm. was on one of the other networks. And, uh, this was a closest election, and he called it wrong and had to apologize before the night <laughs> was over. So it, it, you're not free of you're not free of challenges in, in this situation. Well, at this point, I have to point out that I was invited to go along to these election night um, dues. And the one, the first, the very first one was President Kennedy's win, but by such a narrow uh, margin that uh, you had to be good to call it. And um, John and his team called Kennedy the winner, winner at 2.30 in the morning. But the people at RCA did not believe that it was possible with the election so close that it could be right. And so they would not let any of them out of the studio <laughs> until <laughs> 8 o'clock the next morning. <laughs> and there they were, twiddling their thumbs, tired to death, and uh, well, statistics had gotten ahead of the news media. There were various incidents that I remember a long time, I think. There was one where we called California and New York fairly early. And then, uh, I'm not sure whether this was a senatorial race or president at this point. Because it was but every then, two years. It wasn't just every four oh, years oh, that I they see. had these uh, election night uh, uh, forecasts. It, so... Uh, And then after we called it, the the actual reported vote switched over and went the other way <laughs> and stayed the other way for two hours <laughs> while we sat at the table and, and waited. And eventually it came back. But that uh, stimulated Dave Wallace and I to a considerable updating of the uh, technology that was being used for the forecasting because it was clear that you could do a lot better earlier on uh, than we actually were. Well, there was it also a later occasion uh, in uh, when the affairs were, when we were up, up with the people in the back, in the scene dock for 8H at Radio City, that is the uh, statistical sorts of things and so on were, were in the scene dock, which is a big room adjacent to the, to the main studio. And the people out on the floor were cleaning tape heads in the hope that that would make the program run. <laughs> and uh, essentially the program <laughs> died on it that night, and so uh, we did what we could without, without computer support. <laughs> And that was one of the major elections. It wasn't uh, one of the off-year elections. The technology was always proprietary, but as far as I can tell, nobody has used it since 1980. Essentially, the, the exit <laughs> polls el eliminated the need. Uh -huh. <laughs> they, they could deal with everything except the very close things, and it wasn't worth tooling up just to do a few very close ones. Well, it goes back to the days of how things were tabulated. The conventional plan long ago, when they were getting individual precinct reports in, would be to have a collection of people, each of whom was wired in by telephone to a, a such a certain number of, of precincts. And these people would add things up and then they'd be passed down the table and added up at the foot of the table. And then the tables would be put together and so on, which produced uh, uh, a structure that 
got described in terms of precincts and tables and desks, and <laughs> counties and so on. And essentially it was a hierarchical game where you went up and down once about the turnout and then up and down again using the turnouts that you'd provided, including for the places that hadn't reported. Mm. Then up and down again for the vote. Mm. Now, that's, that's not the whole story, but it's enough of it to give a feeling. John, another kind of a topic currently, of course, the a top national priority happens to be education and concern with it, educational assessment. And I wonder if we could get you to reminisce a bit about the National Assessment for Education progress and let going me back to the let 60s. Let me say that Ralph Tyler told me that he really kind of started that because he knew John could never resist masses of data and that this was to be a gross national product of education. Um, much like the gross national product of e economic things. And with that to start, uh, this must have been about, what, 1962 or 63? Probably something like something that. Something it started like when Ralph had breakfast, I think it was, with Francis Keppel when Keppel was Commissioner of Education. And one of the things mm -hmm. they decided was that since the Organic Act of the Office of Education said one of their responsibilities was to assess the progress of education in the several states. It was perhaps high time to try to do this. And if you worked at it hard, maybe you could do it, start doing it before the centenary of the Organic Act. <laughs> so Ralph came back to uh, Palo Alto to the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, which he was directing in those days, and got a certain number of people involved. One of and them being John Gilbert, who was the statistician there at the time. Yeah, but also uh, a, a, num a number of other people, but uh, including Lyle Jones. But anyway, Lyle Jones and Bob Abelson, and uh, for a while, Kaufman, who used to be at ETS and then went to Iowa, were some of the key players in the Technical Advisory Committee. Mm. Eventually, we got to the place we thought we should try to work our way out, and so we became the Analytical Advisory Committee reporting to the Technical Advisory Committee. This one was a mixture of what you could call statistics and other things. Uh, in the early days, uh, the Technical Advisory Committee spent time uh, looking at the proposed set of questions and icking some of them, saying, throw it out. Now, that wasn't a statistical <laughs> question, it was just a question, was there reasonable multiple answers with the was it reasonable to pick an answer that was different than the one that the man who made the question thought you should pick? Mm -hmm. So again, uh, oh, integrating maybe 80% statistics, going back early on maybe 60% statistics. Mm -hmm. Another bundle of issues that's attracted uh, a lot of attention and, and effort on your part and, and several other people's in the last couple of years, and that has to do with the undercount in the census. Uh, as I recall, you were involved in some of the, the uh, litigation that resulted from the undercount in the 1980 census, but <coughs> uh, maybe the, the statisticians among our viewers would be more interested in some of the issues surrounding the 1990 undercount. Certainly those have, have appeared more prominently in uh, in the media and been covered more, I think, in the statistical literature. Yeah, well, the, uh, the litigation started earlier in 1990, so that 
that uh, there was a stipulation before the census came along. And the essential issues here revolve around the usual fact that one can afford, can afford to measure a sample better than one can afford to measure the entire population. And the census had been aware of this for a long time and had followed up censuses with post-enumeration schemes of one sort and another. After 1980, there was a lot of work done in the Census Bureau, and they came up on schedule with a recommendation that there be a very substantial post-enumeration process and that the results be adjusted. Uh, this was not acceptable to the management of the Commerce Department. This led to Barbara Bela leaving, among other things. And at one stage, the management view is, as near as I can tell, if we don't do the post-enumeration thing, then nobody can ask us to adjust, so we won't. But uh, the litigation took care of that, and there was litigation. It was agreed that they'd do this at a certain scale and that there would be an advisory committee to the secretary for advisory panel, not a, an advisory group made up of four people freely chosen by the secretary and four people chosen from a list of seven provided by the plaintiffs. And I ended up being one of the latter. Now, The uh, four people from the list of the, of the plaintiffs were all uh, technical people, I would say. Two of the other four were Bill Kruskal and uh, Ken Wachter, who's a demographer cum statistician. I think the basic issues here are only two or three. One basic issue is no adjustment will always be an improvement in all details. This is hard for people to accept. The uh, simple example is if you measure, we'll say a hundred things, and you're able to go back and make an independent measurement of the hundred, each of them, and then you've got two measurements on each, what do you do? Well, I think all statisticians and most other people will average the two. This will, the average will be closer to the truth than the initial measurement about two-thirds of the time. That doesn't mean that if you were at the end that you want to use the average instead of using the initial measurement. Now. This isn't exactly a Chinese copy of the census post-enumeration procedure situation, but the, the analogy is strong. Even if you improve things a lot, you do not expect to improve all the local areas. Some will go one way, some will go another. In this case of two-thirds, the one-third that got worse get worse by a, a lot less on average than the two-thirds get better. But the direction, you can't, you, you can't possibly, with any reasonable amount of measurement, guarantee that everything will be better, even if you average 17 independent measurements, as, than it would if you just had the first one. Now, that's one issue. The second issue is that uh, adjustment has political implications. One can tell generally where where there you're going to find relatively more people and where you're going to find <coughs> relatively less. And 
that uh, the political implications have in practice driven the question of what you think about whether adjustment needs to be perfect or not. Mm. If the uh, Democratic Party is in office in 2000, it's going to be very interesting to see whether the view about adjustment is going to turn over. But there were lots of technical issues, and most of these, I think, we got considerable resolution on, partly because Dave and a colleague did some uh, simulations for us. That was a big help. It didn't change anything, but uh, it left us understanding where we were at and why we, why we were saying what we were saying. We were saying all these things individually but to avoid the Federal Advisory Committee Act. So there were, in principle, eight separate re recommendations from the two sets of four members. The four of us from the plaintiff uh, provided a consolidated appendix, but uh, we all wrote our individual recommendations separately, and uh, we thought persuasively, but on the other hand, although the director of the Bureau and Seven of the nine members of the Bureau's undercount committee recommended to the secretary that they adjust. Four of us recommended that we adjust, and four that we don't. Uh, we all know where the secretary came out. An educational experience, and uh, it's left me feeling that we've made a mistake by not teaching people a lot more about adjustment. The elementary facts are easy. You don't have to. You don't have to be sophisticated to find out that what this two thirds is. Uh, you you need to know that a circular Gaussian is circular, or that uh, that a square thing is square. And you find that the, it doesn't matter whether it's uniform uh, independently on two sides or whether it's independently Gaussian, you know, it's a matter, is it 64% or 67% or something of that sort, as you might hope. So I think, I think the profession needs to understand about adjustment, to understand that it's necessarily imperfect, and start teaching the world that that's what happens. That when you do a better job of measurement, you don't improve all the individuals. It's like uh, uh, the one that somebody who was in EPA under a couple of administrators used to say, he was a MD, he used to tell, tell the boss, it's medically demonstrable that it's dangerous to get up in the morning, but it's also de medically demonstrable that it's dangerous to stay in bed. <laughs> the best you can do is to pick between risks, not to eliminate risks. And the best you can do with, with adjust, measurement and adjustment is to pick a good result and not be one that's always the best. Same issue. John, by way of bringing this delightful interview to a close, I'd just like to ask you an open-ended sort of question of, for you to say what two or three of the major new directions for statistics and, uh, and its applications might be as we look down the road? Well, I will guarantee a biased set of comments. <laughs> but presumably that's what you want. That's right. We want your views. I think we now know that we can rebuild multivariate statistics if we're willing to take the effort. The problem is what can you say in terms of intervals or wedges, however you want to put it, for the direction of the larger of two eigenvectors, two-dimensional problem. The Gaussian asymptotic case was done by Ted Anderson in 53. Well, one needs to understand the Gaussian 
finite sample case and how much trimming up it takes. And one needs to understand what about, how far away from the Gaussian can you go? And with a variety of techniques, we can go closely enough to 5% leave me happy, might not leave some other people happy, out to two-dimensional distributions that are the analog of T on three degrees of freedom, circular. Uh, we've done this starting from uh, Ted's results. We've done this starting from jackknife. Uh, you turn out to need almost as much fixing up in the two cases because what the jackknife cures is not what you're sick of. But you can go all the way to there, all right. We, I think, will go on and do s some tetrapolar cases. If you have two coordinates, each of which has a long tail distribution, and the two are independent, then you sort of get cross-shaped contours. You have, if stretching out this way by analogy with the physics is dipole, then this is tetrapole. And essentially you're asking about the direction of the dipole and I think correction for tetrapolarity is going to be possible so that you can live with the case when you have things like this, things that are independent and the major eigenvector goes off somewhere in between. Now, there's a lot of computation here. One lives by simulation. To do the analogous things for the more complicated multivariate things will take even more complicated computation. But the computers that you can afford to buy to put on your desk are gaining in power awfully rapidly. And uh, I don't see that this, that this is out of reach. I think the difficulty will be finding the people who are willing to do it and who are, can learn to have the insight to understand what to explore when you come to something that isn't working quite the way you want it to. But I, th I, think, I think the people and not the compute power is going to be the, the limitation. There are various things cooking in the quasi-supercomputer world that's going to leave leave even more power on the desk than the uh, man from Sun said about, talked about at the Philadelphia meeting of the interface, where he thought 2001 would be, what, uh, a gigabyte of memory and a gigabit compute on your desk in 2001. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to be held down to that, <coughs> the way things have been going. So. So I think, I think there's an opportunity there. It's going to be very hard to retrain people who have learned to manipulate formulas to try to do this sort of thing. But mm. if they don't do it, somebody else will. I think simulation as a whole uh, needs it's a set of opportunities. We don't have good things for somebody to have around so that it's easy to let your machine run overnight when you don't have anything else to do and gradually build up simulated information. And with the capacities going up, also the thing that's happening is that uh, the idea is that if, if your five neighbors aren't using their machines, or you'll grab them for whatever what you're doing on the night scale. One topic that I don't think I understand about, I mean, I've been exposed to elementary expositions, but that doesn't mean you understand, 
is what's really going to come out of Gibbs sampling. One always thought that uh, the things that were associated with the name of Metropolis were interesting curiosities rather than something that people would use to compute things. But in the last few years, this has changed. Now, the part of this that we may have trouble living with is that this has made it possible to compute things, Bayesian things that nobody did think of computing before. So we're going to see some additional pressure on that side. But not all the things that, that, that you get to this way are going to be Bayesian. So whether you're a Bayesian or not, it looks as though you're going to see a new class of things that are in some sense experimental sampling and that answer questions that you don't think of as experimental sampling questions. How far that goes, as I say, I don't know. I don't, I don't consider that I have an adequate feel for what, what goes on in this area. But it seems to me that many of the techniques that we have some experience with and some theory for and so on, reconnecting them to the application and rethinking them is going to be a good investment over the years ahead. And uh, well, as I say, this is a, this is a biased view. Uh, I would expect other people to have other ideas, but uh, well, we'll see. Well, on behalf of the ASA and David and myself, I'd like to thank Elizabeth and you, John, for this delightful afternoon of informal discussion. Ram and David, thank you both for how helpful you've been in making this easy for me and I hope rewarding for our viewers. I'm delighted to have been included in this whole interview and thank you so much for asking me. Well, let me say also uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Elizabeth, for a very informative and, and enjoyable discussion this afternoon. I've learned a great deal about the history and the background of the uh, topics we've discussed. Thank you again.